The following podcast is for informational purposes only. The contents of this podcast do not constitute tax, legal, or investment advice. Take responsibility for your own decisions, consult with the proper professionals, and do your own research. I think access to quick and cheap data about whatever product you're building becomes very important. I think the graph solution does a really good job around doing that. It saves us a ton of developer hassle. Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Garvid Goel, co-founder at Electron Labs, a Web3 solution focused on solving the final bottleneck in Ethereum's scaling roadmap using zero-knowledge proofs. Garvid has an interesting background, having grown up in New Delhi, India, and his early fascination with technology that led him to study chemical engineering before diving into the world of blockchain and Web3. During this interview, Garvey shares his journey from New Delhi to becoming an entrepreneur in the tech space. We discuss his early interest in technology, his unique experiences working in traditional finance, and the insights he gained that eventually led him into the Web3 space. Garvin also talks about his first entrepreneurial venture, Fraction Zero X, and some of the important lessons he learned from it. We then explore the origins of Electron Labs, the challenges and pivots they faced, and how they are innovating in the Ethereum ecosystem. Additionally, Garvin shares his perspective on the importance of distribution, the role of zero-knowledge proofs in scaling Ethereum, his opinion on the graph and Web3 data, and his vision for the future of blockchain. I started the conversation asking Garvit about where he's from. So I grew up in India, New Delhi, and spent most of my life there. Been traveling a lot, you know, in the last one year, though. Tell us about your childhood and growing up in New Delhi. What was it like? What were some of the things you were interested in? So I had like a pretty normal childhood. I wouldn't say a lot of interesting things were happening. You know, New Delhi is like not a very tech hub kind of place. I got interested in the tech side of things pretty early on. You know, India is so different than than US. I'm always like talking to people here and I'm trying to explain them how things are over there. But yeah. When did you become interested in technology? It sounds like it was quite early. What kind of drove that interest and when did it happen? As far as I can recall, probably when I was like four and five, I uh, remember watching a lot of Nat Geo and Discovery Channel and uh, NASA space shuttle launches. And I've been into that stuff ever since then. Yeah. So Garvin, if we talk about New Delhi and India, I think there's a lot of interesting stories that are emerging from that region of the world. And I know specific to the graph community, for example, there's a ton of graph advocates and a very strong community in India. But what can you tell us from your perspective about the Web3 crypto community in New Delhi? I would answer this question, not just for Delhi, but I think the whole of India and Bangalore particularly. The ecosystem, you know, it it pains me to say that it's not as well developed and it's not developing as well as I would want. I think there are several reasons for that. Generally, I think the regulatory scene is a little bit screwed up over there, you know, the government stance and all. And not just the regulatory side, but I think the very nature of crypto market, it's so marketing and business driven. You know, India is great for finding builder kind of founders, okay? But when it comes to marketing and BD, that is still, I think, very much focused on conferences and I would say New York and US and all of that. Yeah, you know, the ecosystem is not as strong and it's not even developing that well at this point, unfortunately. We keep trying at Electron to spread the message in Bangalore. I wish we could do better. Well, I have a lot of follow-up questions about Electron and we'll get there, but I do want to return to your personal story. So eventually you decide to go to university and you study chemical engineering. Talk to us why you chose to study chemical engineering and what was your vision for your career at that point in your life? In crypto, we have this, not just crypto, in tech, I think we have a lot of computer science and electrical engineering graduates. And oftentimes, tech is considered synonymous with software engineering, right? 
But I think if you expand the scope a bit, if you look at the whole human civilization, I think bigger impact happens when you do physical forms of engineering, which are mechanical or aeronautics, you know, or chemical engineering for that matter. That's something that has always been very exciting to me. Getting into chemical engineering was like a natural evolution of that. That was the idea. And it still is to to some extent. I think at some point of time, I want to be building companies that build physical products as opposed to just being software. Yeah. And this brain, this engineering brain has come up on the podcast many times. I've had the opportunity to interview a lot of builders, a lot of entrepreneurs, contributors to Web3. And it does seem like a lot of them have a background in some type of engineering. And in your case, it's chemical engineering. But I want to ask you this question. I mean, do you think there is something to this engineer brain, this way an engineer approach problems and building that sort of primes them for entrepreneurship? Oh, it's an interesting question. So definitely, if you're building a tech company, then I think having that engineering uh, aptitude becomes very important. We live in a world where most of the entrepreneurship is tech driven. So we see this accumulation of engineering talent in in entrepreneurship. I think in in future, when AI becomes more prevalent, and we see a lot of non-tech folks start companies as well, I think this might change actually. And how would you describe the way you use your background and training in chemical engineering and what you're doing now in Web3? I mean, does it apply? Is it a dot-to-dot implementation? The content that we study in chemical engineering is super different. What I've always felt is that uh, what's more important is that engineering mindset and that aptitude to approach certain problems. And I think uh, we've just applied that here in Web3 and ZK as well. So it's always like good to have that specific knowledge of computer science and all of that. But I haven't personally cared for that too much, you know, in my uh, approach to building companies. There are some obviously like subject overlaps, like we used to do a lot of calculus, uh, mathematics in chemical engineering, which obviously gets used a lot in ZK and all. The GRTIQ podcast is made possible by a generous grant from the Graph Foundation. The Graph Grants program provides support for protocol infrastructure, tooling, gaps, subgraphs, and community building efforts. Learn more at the Graph.Foundation. That's the Graph.Foundation. Hi, this is GRTIQ, and thank you for listening. Listeners who enjoy this content can help support the GRTIQ podcast by leaving a review or a five-star rating wherever they download podcasts, by sharing episodes on social media, or by simply telling a friend or colleague about something they heard or learned from one of our guests. It's support from listeners like you that make it possible for us to keep shining a light on the people and stories behind Web3 and the graph. So at what point in your life then did you become aware of crypto? You're studying chemical engineering. You've got early aptitude in your life for technology growing up in New Delhi. At some point, you become aware of Web3, crypto, blockchain, you know, whatever it was. When was that? And do you remember what your first impressions were? So I was traveling to UK for like a summer exchange kind of thing. And I started reading this magazine called The Economist. Okay, It's like a super uh, mainstream media and a super boomer kind of magazine. There was this article about Bitcoin and initial coin offerings. I think the Ethereum ICO hadn't happened at that time, if I recall correctly. And I looked at it and I was like, okay, this is uh, this is <laughs> fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah, I started following a lot of finance back then. Okay, So it was quite revolutionary, but I was still new to finance. So I was like still coming to terms with that. So I, I just looked at it and then, then I forgot about it. It was in the back of my mind for a couple of years, but I didn't really do anything in it. Then when I got closer to graduation in 17, I was like looking to start a company and I was just looking for ideas. Then I started to look at blockchain a little bit more seriously and I'm trying to understand the technology on all of that. And it made a lot of sense to me at that point. What was the unlock? I mean, you're revisiting it. So your first impression was, what is this? And then the second impression was, there might be something here. Help us understand how you sort of got to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the biggest difference, you know, why I understood it the second time was because in these two different situations, I had a chance to do a finance internship. Okay. 
So uh, we all know a famous company called Lehman Brothers over here in the US. So when Lehman Brothers collapsed, their Asia business was acquired by a bank called Nomura. It's a pretty big Japan-based bank. So I was in Nomura's uh, you know, Mumbai office in the market risk division. And I had a chance to look at the finance industry very closely. Okay, all the data from all over the world that Nomura was trading on, that used to come into our division, to our team. And our job was to like perform some sort of analytics and drive some information out of that. I had a lot of exposure to how this entire company was running. And when I saw that, I was like, you know, very surprised that how the hell is this entire finance industry even able to operate? You would expect that a large bank like Nomura would be very organized and all the information would be available in the right places. But that wasn't the case. It was total utter chaos. And it wasn't because the company was operating in a wrong way. It was just the size of the bank was so massive, you know, that just getting the information was a hard problem. So when I learned that, I realized that, okay, there are a lot of inefficiencies in finance. And once I actually looked at the blockchain technology, I could see that anyone building using the blockchain technology would have a massive advantage over any existing financial institution. So that's that's how it kind of came together for me. So after a few sort of internships and some work, as you mentioned there, in pharmaceuticals and finance, in 2018, you launched Fraction Zero X. Is that your first entrepreneurial venture there? And, And talk to us a little bit about what the backstory is. Yeah, it was pretty much my first one. Like I had like a thing in college as well, but it wasn't like really a very serious startup. So I would call Fraction as my first one. I was just returning from that Nomura internship and I had just learned about crypto and blockchain and all of that. So I was like looking to start a company in blockchain in the financial sector. That was the motivation behind Fraction Zero X. Talking a little bit about the problem statements we were working on at Fraction, our idea was very simple, okay? We could see that with this advent of blockchain technology, we're going to end up with this massive liquidity pool on chain. A lot of capital would exist on chain. It would be the most connected and the least fragmented form of capital out there. Okay, All other forms, whether it's banking industry or whatever else we have, are super fragmented. So we could see that. And we could see that over time, this liquidity pool is going to become a massive sort of limited partner or an LP for all other forms of investments out there. So that was our thesis, okay? So if you were like a fund, okay, like you were like a trad five fund, let's say a private equity fund or anything or a mutual fund, rather than trying to raise capital from the trad five markets, you would just try to sell it on-chain because on-chain would be the biggest form of liquidity pool ever, okay? So that was like our thesis. And we were we started building this, platform that would enable this on-chain liquidity to get invested in the Asian and emerging market securities and bonds and all of that. So imagine like a like a bank from Brazil getting tokenized, it's getting its equity tokenized, and then that, that token is trading against other cryptocurrencies. So that was our thesis, what we were trying to build, uh, super inspired by the work at Nomura. But yeah, we could never really get it to work because the, of the regulatory side and all of that. Well, I want to ask you a question about entering into entrepreneurship. So clearly you went to work in blockchain and you were working on crypto type things, but at a grand view, you decided to become an entrepreneur. And while I was doing my research on you, it seems like it was reading the book by Peter Till. I believe Zero to One is the title. You had an experience there or an epiphany there that kind of set you up for wanting to pursue entrepreneurship. Do I have that right? Yeah, absolutely. So reading that book wasn't like the reason I left. It was more like the last straw. I was like going through a phase where it was pretty clear to me that I wanted to start a company. The problem I consistently faced was I couldn't find anyone to discuss my ideas with. Like no matter who I found, whether my relatives or, you know, or my friends, they were all like, dude, you're crazy. You know, this stuff doesn't make any sense to me. So I started reading that book because since I couldn't find anyone in my own personal life to talk about that, I was looking on the internet. So I found this book and I didn't even know who Peter Thiel was back then. I just read that book because, you know, Elon Musk had a testimonial on the back of it. 
And I thought, okay, this guy is obviously interesting. So if he's recommending this book, maybe I should read it. And I started reading that. And I was like, after like a couple of paragraphs, I was like, okay, this guy is clearly talking about the exact shit that's going on in my head right now. So uh, maybe I'm not that crazy. You know, maybe all of my friends who think I'm crazy, they are the ones who are crazy. So I couldn't wait anymore after that. I was like, okay, I need to, I need to start a company right now. Like not wait even a single day anymore. I, and I resigned the very next day from my job. It's an amazing story. And I want to talk about entrepreneurship and again, a little bit more about that experience. You've also written about the darkest 14 days of your life and kind of going through this, I believe it was either that transition period or close to it. But what can you tell us about that 14 days and where it sort of fits into this transition? Yeah. So this was like the last phase of that transition, right? So I had just graduated. Okay. And I joined this analytics company in Mumbai. The moment I joined the company, I had already decided to start up back then. Okay. It was just a question of when. And my, my plan initially was to spend like a couple of, you know, months, maybe, you know, probably six months to a year in that company and then start a company. But when I was there, uh, you know, we were going through that entire uh, onboarding journey, training, and, you know, getting your eye cards made and all of that. Okay. It was like a pretty corporate setting. One day I was like, dude, I can't go through this. Like, again, as I told you that I had no one to talk to my ideas, you know, about. And there was absolutely no one willing to talk about blockchain or start a company in general. I got into this really, got back into this corner kind of a situation where I just didn't know what to do. So I was going through this period for these like, you know, two weeks I was spending at this company. Eventually it got so bad for me, psychologically speaking, that the only way I felt I would be able to stay sane is by actually leaving that company and starting on a company of my own. So, yeah. That's an amazing psychological experience. It wasn't like, amazing for me. It was pretty crazy, man. Like I thought I was going crazy. <laughs> I understand the depth of it. What I'm saying, I think, is that it's remarkable that there was this push and pull internally about what you felt like you had to do and what you were sort of fighting up against. And that is really this pull of entrepreneurship. I mean, that was really kind of you accepting your life mission. Is that a way to kind of think about this? You could say that, yes. You know, yeah, I would, I would exactly put it like that, in fact. What did you learn about entrepreneurship then? If getting into entrepreneurship was such a challenge for you, as you've described it here, the actual activities and the energy required to be a successful entrepreneur is something entirely different, right? You, you could say that, actually. So uh, having a good enough reason to start a company is one thing. But when you actually try to execute things, that entrepreneurial energy is, it just keeps you alive, okay? But it doesn't actually get you the business. It doesn't actually, you know, run your company for you. It just gives you the energy for that, okay? And in order to build a successful company, as it turns out, you need a lot of skills, that, that you actually acquire by working in another company. So I didn't have that. Like I didn't have any job experience at all. And I learned that pretty quickly, like in the first month of me trying to start up. And I'm like, dude, what the fuck did I just do? Because I have no experience of how things actually work out there. And all I have right now is my desire and energy to do these things. So that realization <laughs> hit me pretty quickly. I had no choice but to keep pushing through. Yeah, eventually after making a lot of mistakes, uh, things started to come come on track a little bit. But it took a lot of time to get there. Do you mind sharing? And I always assume there's entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs listening to this podcast and they learn from experiences and stories of people like you. Do you mind sharing what maybe two or three of the most important lessons you learned about entrepreneurship during that period of your life? I think the biggest takeaway was I used to think that the excitement I have about my company, everyone shares that, okay? And it took me like a lot of time to realize that in order to get people excited about either working for my company or working with me as a company or, you know, as a customer of my company or investing in my company, these people will need something else other than just excitement about that idea. Because I was running on that excitement and, you know, my desire to do this thing for a very long time. And I just assume everyone would do that. So I think that realization took a lot of time to take root. I think that's the one of the biggest ones. 
There are quite a few small ones I would point out that every entrepreneur realizes over time. I would say just learning how to build teams, you know, learning how to find ideas that are worth working on. I think every entrepreneur goes through this journey where they can't figure out what is the right idea to work on because what they might want to work on might not be the most relevant one for the market. And what is actually useful for the market may not be exciting for the entrepreneur. So finding that sweet spot, which is both useful, which is both exciting for you and the market, I think that itself is a very complicated journey for someone like me, especially who doesn't have any job experience. So I had to go through that again for a very long time, trying to figure out what's the right, you know, right thing to build. It's a pretty dark journey. It's a pretty hard journey to go through that. If you make it through that, then obviously on the other side, things are a lot better and a lot more fun. A question I routinely ask entrepreneurs on the podcast here is their relationship with fear. And it's sort of personal because I've always had this thesis that one of the reasons people don't pursue entrepreneurship or once they begin, they might quit is they have a fear of failure. And it's just a thesis, but I'm curious. I mean, what's What's your relationship to fear? Were you ever afraid of failure or is that not something you worry about? Anyone who's saying they're not afraid of failure is lying. I think everyone is afraid of that. I think in my situation, again, the problem was not fear of failure. I had a bigger fear, which was fear of mediocrity. That was a bigger fear for me. So I was willing to be a total utter of failure, but I was not willing to be mediocre. So that fear was actually a bigger driving factor for me. Look, ultimately for everyone, no matter what they do, fear tends to be the biggest driving factor. It's just a question of what are they scared about. If you're fearful of failure, then you end up doing things that are safer. But if you are like, you know how Jeff Bezos says that when he's 80, he doesn't want to regret not starting a company. So it's like that. What's what's a bigger failure that you have? Or what's a bigger fear that you have that's actually driving you? So That's a great way to put it. So as you mentioned earlier, Fraction Zero X, didn't quite succeed because there were some issues on the regulatory side that were difficult to solve for. So talk to us then, returning to your personal story, talk to us what you did after Fraction Zero X. Yeah. So with Fraction, I think the biggest mistake we made was we didn't know how to select the problem statement in the right way. We we just picked up the most difficult problem statement we could think of and totally didn't evaluate the feasibility of executing that. So I think this was the biggest realization and going forward, whatever startup ideas I was experimenting with, I think I was trying to find out how hard or easy it would be to execute that and finding a sweet spot. So I then focused on hard tech ideas, uh, did a lot of experimentation around eSIMs. You know, eSIMs are obviously very popular now, but back a couple of years ago, they were still early. I uh, actually set up like a hydroponic farm. I don't know if you know what hydroponics is, but I don't. It's like a way to grow food without using soil. So you have like, I could call it like a nutrient solution. And it has a substrate on it where you can actually plant the seed and then it grows out. So it's like a lab grown kind of crop situation, except that it doesn't need your uh, real world soil. So I was trying to experiment with that. I got into a bit of botany as well as a result of that. And did a lot of experiments like this in a lot of different domains. But none of them were actually reaching a stage where you could turn them into companies. So there were a lot of experiments, but none of them could be turned into businesses. It was pretty clear. So I was, again, through a, like a whole, I think, two-year period, I was just doing a lot, ton of experiments. This is COVID period as well. So I was like doing a lot of these experiments in my basement at my parents' house. And I did that for two years. Eventually, I uh, I started Electron. You know, when I could see that crypto is the best sweet spot of being a hard problem and an executable uh, problem as well. Well, let's double click then on the origins of Electron. As you said, in 2021, you went to work and launched Electron. Before we talk about what it is and how it works, talk to us about where the idea came from. What were you sort of thinking about as a founder or the problem statement to use some terminology you've been using? What was it that you were working on or thinking about at that time? I was just working on a lot of ideas, you know, that I was just pulling out of my hat. They didn't make a lot of sense, but I was still pursuing a lot of these ideas, okay? The biggest issue in 2021 was there were so many chains out there 
and all of them seemed very promising. And the hardest problem that an entrepreneur or that a crypto founder had to make was which chain to build on, which ecosystem do you associate yourself with? And we could see that this was like a decision that should not be taken so early on in the journey of a company. While at the same time, entrepreneurs were being forced to make that decision. Because once you deploy on a particular chain, it's really hard to change ecosystems very easily. So I was facing this problem myself. That's why this whole idea of building a cross-chain solution came to me. That what if we could just connect all these ecosystems together and connect all the liquidity? This idea of selecting a chain to build on would be irrelevant. Because you can be on any chain and access liquidity of any chain. Okay. So this was like the motivation behind starting Electron. So we started like as a cross-chain company. As we started to build it, we realized there were a lot of infrastructure problems in crypto and you couldn't actually build applications that easily. So that's when we started to look into zero-knowledge proofs as a way to solve that problem. And we have been like a ZK company ever since. And we've been doing a lot of experiments and products around that. And the name Electron, where did it come from? I just like electrons, man. I like chemistry in general. So, yeah. (laughs) Well, you just did a nice overview there when you were talking about Electron and the problem. And so not dissimilar to other entrepreneurial ventures and stories shared on this podcast, there was a little bit of a pivot there. There was a original vision and then a pivot towards ZK. Is that correct? There were multiple pivots, yes. (laughs) Is that hard to do? I mean, you kind of start with the vision. You've got a ton of interest and energy towards this one thing and you end up changing multiple times. Is that something hard to do or is that just part of the job of being an entrepreneur? I would say it's part of the job. It's like when you do it for the first couple of times, it's very scary. But then you, you know, you realize it's part of the process. And in fact, every time you make a pivot, it's a big relief because you're like, oh, I don't have to work on that crappy problem anymore, which wasn't working out for me anyway. So. Pre-pivots, it's super hard. Post-pivot, it's super relieving. And so as I've shared with you, a lot of my audience is non-technical. Of course, there's a few that are. You're saying things like ZK. I know that has some relation to scaling Ethereum. Can you take a swing at just sort of describing the value proposition of Electron in a way that non-technical listeners might be able to understand or comprehend? Yeah, let me try that. I actually try that often, but I haven't done a very good job of that so far. So let me try again. So I like to think of Electron as the final bottleneck in the Ethereum scaling roadmap, okay? So I think I can assume that everyone has some idea that rollups are being touted as the solution for scaling Ethereum, okay? See, even rollups have their own scalability limits, okay? And that limit comes from the fact that all rollups are required to submit a ZK proof on Ethereum. And submitting that ZK proof on Ethereum is still quite expensive. So I believe that's the scalability limit to Ethereum at this point. We solve that problem. We make it cheaper to submit proofs on Ethereum by up to 95%. So that's like a high-level value prop. That's super helpful. I appreciate you kind of going through that. Why is Ethereum's scaling problems still a going concern? And let me provide some context here, but clearly Ethereum right next to Bitcoin is a market leader, the most well-known, all of these things, everybody's using and building, all the L2s are coming up around it. And yet there's continual concern and kind of regard for Ethereum scaling. I mean, is this a problem that we persist into the future that's hard to ever address? Is this something we sort of address sooner than later or we must? Help us understand sort of the nature of these problems associated with scaling Ethereum. Yeah. So I would actually like draw an analogy with with the internet era, okay? And how there were scaling issues even with the internet in the early days. So if you look at Google's story in, let's say, early 2000s, Google had this problem that they had a ton of traffic coming in, a lot of search traffic coming in, and they couldn't actually build the backend infrastructure to serve those requests. So Google like went through a couple of years of scaling journey where they figured out how to actually serve the internet at that scale. 
and while we have this view today that you know internet scales infinitely and that no matter what application you build and no matter how many users you onboard in web2 you will always be able to serve them this wasn't true like 20 years ago when google was trying to scale so internet actually had to go through this computer science r&d journey to solve those issues i think we're going through a similar journey in crypto where we don't know how to have enough block space going going around that can serve all these use cases out there but we are improving i think with roll ups we've created a lot more block space and i think in the short to medium term you know we are going to continue to see this problem scalability as the limit to what we can build with chains although i think over a decade or let's say a 10 to 15 year period scaling would be like a solved problem and we'll have abundant block space going around and we'll have other problems to deal with as opposed to just scaling and so there's different types of rollups right there's the optimistic and the zk i've got that correct right mm, yeah yeah so talk to us about why you're focusing on zk and is it too much of a stretch to say you know there's a little bit of competition here between optimistic and zk or is it more a question of utility some types of rollups fit a use case better than others, and it's not necessarily a competition for market share or adoptions per se. If you go back like a year ago, optimistic rollups were like all the rage compared to zk rollups. Okay, and people were more excited about the optimistic approach. But I think as the market is maturing, people are realizing that optimistic approach doesn't work. Zk is the ultimate. and the final solution for this it's the right way and pretty much the only way to do things so you can do optimistic for a while it can serve as a bridge while you get to the zk future but i think eventually zk has so many advantages around finality that optimism or the optimistic approach is actually going away pretty much people have realized that by now i think zk is turning out if you look at the scrolls growth and all i think it's kind of settling the debate for us at this point and obviously there's there's always some competition but what i what I, actually i heard this some you know very recently that all these optimistic roll up companies are actually looking to launch their own zk versions very soon so i i think that answers your question about competition no it does and i was going to ask that follow up of how one migrates to the other so when you think about electron and competition among other zk rollups or service providers what makes electron unique we are the only ones solving the problem that we're solving okay in fact i was at the google zk summit for these last two days here in sf and i i was talking to all the zk companies and everyone is focused on one part of the zk equation which is the proof generation side okay so how can we make proof generation faster how can we make it cheaper how can we make it easier to build these zk circuits and everyone is working on that problem statement they're all competing with each other i think electron is unique in the sense that we're not solving for proof generation we are actually solving for proof verification which is as i told you just a while back is proof verification on ethereum is super expensive no one in the zk space no one in the ethereum scaling roadmap is talking about this problem the cost of verifying proofs on ethereum that's what makes us unique that we are pretty much the only company actually addressing this problem are there use cases beyond that and you know again a non technical question the answer could be very simply no but are there use cases beyond that that have you excited about kind of the future of electron or zk proofs Oh, no i i disagree so i think zk zk proofs will eventually get abstracted away for the users i think that's already happening to some extent now so i am not excited particularly about applications outside crypto or for that matter or anything like that makes sense and i appreciate you answering that so a couple of specific questions about the tech and the things that you're building at electron lab so for example there's this sdk what can you tell us about the electron labs sdk and sort of how that fits into the story. Yeah, so I'll just give you like an overview of our product. So I'll give you an analogy, okay? Think of the current situation. So if you want to submit a proof on Ethereum, it will cost you more than 50 million dollars every year if you want to submit a lot of proofs on Ethereum, okay? That's like owning a private jet. 
what electron enables to happen is we are like a commercial airline service where you don't actually own the entire jet. You just pay for your own slice of the seat and you you get to the destination at a much cheaper price. Okay. So that's what our product does. The, the way our SDK works is it, it accepts proofs from our customers, aggregates it with a bunch of other proofs from other customers, and creates this mother of all super proof, which is then sent to Ethereum. Okay. So rather than everyone sending their own proof on Ethereum, they aggregate it with, with, our, with us and we send it to Ethereum on their behalf, which allows us to amortize the cost amongst all these different protocols. So the quantum SDK is, is like that integration tool for our customers to leverage this service. Amazing. And if listeners want to kind of learn more and read the docs and things like that, what's the best way for them to go a little deeper here? We, we actually operate pretty solid developer communities that people can find through our docs and code base. You can even join them. We have a lot of people hanging out over there already. You know, you can chat around with our team, set up a call, read through our docs. We've recorded a ton of videos that you can check out. And we are regularly posting on Twitter as well. So these are all the places where you can learn about us. I think one of the things that listeners will be impressed with as they Google and look into the things you're working on Electron Labs is the list of partners that have come forward and are supporting your work. So people like Polygon, Aligned Layer, Gnosis, Chainsafe, and the list goes on and on. Talk to us about what it's been like working with such a strong group of partners and what you've learned from that type of support. Yeah, so I think the biggest takeaway has been that I think we have proven to ourselves and the market that we have PMF. Okay, every time we have a conversation with these folks, I think these guys very clearly realize all these polygons and nauseous and chain safes of the world, they have been facing this problem themselves. So when we go to them, we can see that they're super excited about integrating with our solution and working with us, which is exactly what we needed. I think we have a few companies in the Ethereum ecosystem right now that can claim to have PMF as a result. For listeners of this podcast who are enthusiastic about the graph, I always like to ask a couple of questions to guess, especially someone like yourself, about the graph and Web3 data. I mean, I presume you're familiar with the graph and would just be curious to know what your opinion is or if you've ever used it, the protocol. Our engineering team was actually experimenting with the graph a while back. And I think we are looking forward to integrating it in one of our products going forward. Having said that, one of the interesting things I want to mention here is that I was just looking at the graph solution and how it's an indexing service and all of that. Aggregation layers need their own indexing service, actually. And it could be like an interesting business segment for the graph foundation. Amazing insight there. Yeah, that's a great idea. And that's one of the first times it's come up on the podcast. for. My non-technical audience listening to a builder out there with a strong vision and a lot of persistence in building and bringing their vision to life, do you mind just sort of describing how important that indexing and querying of blockchain data is for for builders like yourself in the space? Absolutely. So as you you know go about building these products, whether it's a bridge or a DeFi application, I think access to quick and cheap data about whatever product you're building becomes very important. I think the graph solution does a really good job around doing that. It saves us a ton of developer hassle and it just makes our entire go-to-market strategy a lot more seamless. So returning to Electron, you mentioned a couple of ways for listeners to kind of learn more. You gave us an overview of the, the product and the services and you presently have that unique position of being the only one working on a really important problem in the Ethereum space. And I'm thinking about zero to one again and Peter Thiel's argument in that book about, you know, you want to avoid competition. It's far better to be a monopoly in that sense. What have you learned about entrepreneurship this time? New lessons, new insights by virtue of your work at Electron? Yeah, quite a few actually. And, you know, I want to say I I disagree with Peter Thiel over there. I mean, obviously, as a business, you don't want to have competition. But I think this doesn't apply to the modern style of building companies anymore. Because the moment a problem statement, a good product is identified, everyone wants a piece of that. Okay, So even if you enter a market that doesn't have a lot of competition, the moment you announce your product, 10 different companies will pop up. And we're already seeing that with, with Electron as well. We see a lot of copycats and other companies that are trying to copy us come up all the time. 
I don't think that as a business, you have the liberty of not being in competition anymore these days. You can try a new space, but it won't stay a greenfield space for very long. So just wanted to add that. And I think there are a ton of learnings otherwise, you know, which I believe are not out there in any of the books like Zero to One or all sorts of amazing books that we have out there. I would just say that I think one of the biggest learnings I had as an entrepreneur, one of the best advice I received was don't focus on just the product, but distribution as well. And sometimes distribution can actually be a much bigger uh, advantage or moat than actually having a great tech and product. I've seen some chatter on Twitter recently about that very idea. And so I appreciate you highlighting that. And I think just a couple searches for any listener that wants to explore product versus distribution and some of the online discussion about that. We'll find some interesting things on Twitter on that topic. I only have a few more questions for you before I ask you the GRT IQ 10, Garvit, and very interested to hearing your answers to those questions. The first question I want to ask you is, in addition to your work on Electron, you're also working in some angel investing. You've kind of referred to it as the first check-in. Talk to us about the range of things you're exploring. I mean, I looked up some of the things. You've got particle accelerators and quantum computing. It's quite a range, and it's certainly outside of crypto and Web3. What, what are you working on, and, and what has you excited about that? Look, I have this very strong belief that science needs to ultimately become part of... Uh... Okay, let me step back. So if you look at the last 200 years, okay, and if you look at the modern lifestyle, okay, the television sets, the aircrafts and everything, all these things became possible because somebody was conducting a research in a lab somewhere 200 years ago. They discovered something. Somebody decided to pick up that discovery, engineer that into a product and you know release it for the masses. And there are every single modern day device that we have is an example of that. The reason I'm excited about these two quantum computing and particle accelerators as, as an area is because lately, if you look at the last 50 years, you will not see that a lot of science has actually converted into real-world products. I mean, some of it, but not too much. So I think that needs to change. Somehow we need to go back to that era where scientific discoveries were making it to real-world products pretty quickly. Okay, So I think these two areas will, will enable that to happen. And that's one of the reasons you know I've been looking out for entrepreneurs, building in these domains, and would love to help however, however I can for those folks. Well, I encourage listeners to visit your LinkedIn page, and I'll put links in the show notes to see some of the things you're interested in and some of the partnerships and angel investing that you're doing. It's super interesting. The next question I want to ask you is about Web3 and just kind of get your opinion on what needs to be the next big thing? What's the next big unlock for the industry to sort of reach wider adoption? And I asked this question in the context of so much of the discussion in the industry presently being that we have the infrastructure, we need something else if we're going to kind of get to the next level to cross that chasm, if you will. What's your opinion on that? You know, it's a very difficult question. I wish I could give you those three things, you know, that we could do as an industry that would get us into that mass adoption phase. I think no one in the industry, including myself, has any clue what those three things are. And I think we are all searching for it. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, we happen to be in that situation uh, right now. And it's probably the reason for all the doom and gloom in the industry right now. I, I wish I could give you like a more uh, exciting and a uh, hopeful answer. But I, I just don't have it right now. Maybe maybe in future when I do, I, I'll pin you. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, please do. And I totally understand. I don't think a lot of guests do have clarity on that. And I think in a lot of ways, the industry as a whole is sort of searching for the answer. Then if that's true, and then the final question here before the GRTIQ 10, what makes you optimistic then about the future of the industry? I mean, certainly we're still working on and trying to figure out many things, including how to scale Ethereum efficiently how to reach mass adoption, but yet builders like you persist and continue showing up each day. Where's that optimism come from? I think the fundamental belief is still there that we can solve very important problems using this approach. Some of the problems you faced, uh, I have faced myself. And again, going back to my first internship at Nomura, you know, where I could see that, yes, there are a lot of inefficiencies in the system. 
So uh, as they say, the world is built on hope and that's that's what we are living on these days. So hopefully we'll get there eventually. Yeah. Well, Garvit, now we've reached a point where I'm going to ask you the GRT IQ 10. Longtime listeners of the podcast know I ask these questions to each guest every week. And as I always say, I do this because, first of all, it lets us get to know you a little bit more on the personal side. But also, I, I think listeners who are paying attention and sort of keeping track of all these great answers every week will probably learn something new, try something different, or achieve more in their own life. So, Garvin, are you ready for the GRT IQ 10? Absolutely. Please shoot away. The GRT IQ 10. This is the way. 10 questions for astronauts floating G-R-T. in space. What book or article has had the most impact on your life? I, I don't read a lot of books, but as I said, I just went through the first page of Zero to One, and that was it. Yeah. Is there a movie or a TV show that you would recommend everybody should watch? Uh, there's a TV series by Nat Geo called American Genius about how all these uh, interesting companies like, you know, Henry Ford and all these people, they were building companies 100 years ago. Yeah, I would recommend everyone to watch that. And how about this one, Garvin? If you could only listen to one music album for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? Any, any ambient music, man. Like, I'm not a big music listener, but I just listen to random shit on YouTube. <laughs> And what's the best advice someone's ever given to you? I think it's part of my crypto and startup journey. A lot of people told me that focus on distribution more than tech and product. And I, I think I've realized that with time. So, And what's one thing you've learned in your life that you don't think most other people have learned or know quite yet? I say this often, you know, especially in crypto, people are, have this extremely short-sightedness to everything. And I strongly believe that being actually good and doing the right thing pays fruits in the long run. Not many people agree with this. People think that just, you know, getting what you want somehow gets you through life. I don't I don't agree with that. And Garva, what's the best life hack you've discovered for yourself? I've been trying meditation a little bit, but it hasn't worked that much for focus and all. So yeah, I, I would say I'm still experimenting. I haven't found like a silver bullet. And then based on your own life experiences and observations, what's the one habit or characteristic that you think best explains how people find success in life? It comes down to how much you want something and for what reasons you want it. If you want it for the right reasons, and if you're really willing to put in the effort, go through that extremely harsh journey, I think you'll get there. And then lastly, Garbit, the final three questions are complete the sentence type questions. So the first one is, The thing that most excites me about the future of Web3 is? Hopefully, we'll eventually see mass adoption. (laughs) And how about this? If you're on X, I still refer to it as Twitter. I mean, I do it verbally. I do it written. Uh, So if you're on Twitter, then you should be following. Well, you should definitely follow Electron's uh, Twitter account. But other than that, I follow this guy called Andrew Court, who's like a good deep tech thinker, and he posts quite interesting content around that. And then the final question, Garbit, is... I'm happiest when? After like putting in a hard day of work and uh, getting good results from that by the end of the day. <laughs> the GRT IQ 10. And I show you how deep the podcast is. Garvin, thank you so much for joining the GRT IQ podcast. What an exciting thing to hear about your approach and your entry into entrepreneurship and then the amazing problems that you're working on at Electron. And as you described it here today, I'm very excited about the future. And I'm sure like a lot of listeners, I'll be watching and cheering for your success on this important problem. If listeners want to stay in touch with you, follow things you're working on, how can they stay in touch? Uh, We have a solid online presence. I think Twitter account is the best way to do that. Other than that, we have multiple uh, developer and business-centric Telegram chats that we operate. Feel free to join them. Yeah. This has been a production of the GRT IQ podcast. For more information, including detailed show notes, visit grtiq.com slash podcast. That's grtiq.com slash podcast. Please consider contributing to this project and helping build the community by subscribing and leaving a review. GRT IQ podcast. Look at that.